Hello everyone and welcome to this talk about Victorian Gateshead. Gateshead, like many other towns in the 19th century, changed its character completely from a rural area to a bustling urban town with a huge increase in population, an increase which led to all sorts of problems in town. Unfortunately, the housing stock, which was predominantly situated around the quayside and around the high street, didn't keep pace with this increase in population, with the result that many properties became overcrowded, disease was rife, diseases such as cholera, typhus and typhoid. The problem was much of Gateshead was owned by estate owners, people who would have control of a large uh, quantity of acres, who would build on their properties, uh, typically a house, um, stables, uh, perhaps lodges. Gradually, as the century progressed, they realised that one very lucrative uh, thing that they could do would be to sell off this land for housing, and that's what they did, with the result that areas such as Bencham and the teens became covered in what was a fairly monotonous uh, grid pattern of the new Tyneside flat, um, designed for um, the working people. Um, plain dwellings usually, but certainly an improvement on the slum conditions uh, in which people had to, uh, had to live. Um, no one needed to be out of work. There were plenty of opportunities for work, unless you were physically incapable of work. Uh, there were always things that you could do. So I'd now like to show you um, a selection of photographs, and I'm just going to talk these uh, through. So this is St Mary's Church, Gateshead's mother church, the only church uh, in Gateshead until St John's was built in, 19, in 1820. And originally everyone in Gateshead lived around this um, church. By the time of Victoria's reign in 1837, um, the bulk of people were living along the quayside and uh, up Gateshead uh, High Street. This is Pipewell Gate, and this is a view looking at Pipewell Gate from uh, the Newcastle side of the river. And I think you can see the conditions that people were living in. This is a really uh, interesting photograph. Uh, it was taken in 1886. You can see the high level bridge appearing out of the gloom. The small, the, the lower building in the centre with the um, triangular pantide roof was the Fountain Inn, which was a really ancient um, public house. You can see a lot of these um, properties have jetties, stairs and jetties, and little boats um, to use for fishing or um, to go across the river, whatever. This is another view of Pipel Gate. So the riverside uh, is on the right of the photograph. And well, you can see what this uh, looks like. Um, the street was described as eight feet, 10 inches in width. There's one little street lamp. Um, it was said in the winter, the sun never shone in Pipergate. And you can quite understand how that would be. The, um, the houses on the right of the photograph were predominantly lodging houses. Um, one of these, uh, had 56 people uh, housed in 13 rooms. People didn't just share rooms, they shared beds as well. This is a little area known as Providence Place, an optimistic name for a slum dwelling. Um, you can see how worn those stairs are and the outbuildings at the front, uh, the, the toilet, the privy or the netty and the coal store. And you can also see um, an external staircase that would lead you to um, another apartment. These, of course, originally were quite well built properties designed for one family. 
But by the mid 1850s, these were being occupied by, uh, were in multiple occupancy. This is one of my favorite photographs. This is of um, an area known as Wood Rhubarb Terrace, which ran off Gateshead High Street. The roofs are interesting. A lot of these are pan tiles. And of course, um, these would come in on ships from the Netherlands as, as ballast. Uh, they'd leave the town, town with coal and come back with, with these as ballast. And you can see the washing hanging up from the, um, the window there. And this is Leonard's Court. Now, you definitely didn't want to live here. This was a haunt of the um, Irish population in Gateshead. This ran off the high street. Um, there's no drainage. There were no standpipes. There were no public privies. And uh, in the uh, 1853 cholera epidemic, there was one death in every house in this, uh, in this street. This is Melbourne Street. Now, these properties were built in 1837 and designed um, for the sort of middle classes. The problem was they were built without any drainage. So within a couple of years, they were just damp infested. And they ended up really as not much better than, than, than the slums they sought to um, improve on. They were really badly constructed. And this is the area of the um, south end of the high street, the area known as um, the Chandless Estate. Street after street of properties um, described as a Dickensian rookery. And you've got the ubiquitous um, public house on the corner, the, um, the Mason's Arms there. Now I've mentioned cholera. Um, there were three outbreaks of cholera, but this memorial commemorates the first, which broke out at Christmas 1831. It was erected by the rector of St. Mary's, the Reverend John Collinson, and it's very unusual to um, find cholera memorials. So this is something very interesting. Uh, it commemorates 222 persons who died of cholera. Well, actually, there were 234 who died. So this is either an error or we've got um, 12 missing burials. This is the dispensary. Now, this was set up um, in 1832, but not this building. This building um, was used from 1855 onwards. Uh, the original building was on Gateshead High Street. And the idea of the dispensary was that um, the poor could go and access medicines and treatment uh, at very low prices. They were founded by subscription, so people would subscribe to the dispensary each year and the amount that they gave entitled them to a number of letters, letters of introduction, if you like. They could give these to their friends, their family and to their servants, so if any were ill, they could present themselves at the dispensary with a letter. Now, if you didn't have a letter, you would be seen, but it would be a long wait. And you can still see this building today. It's next to the old town hall uh, at Gateshead. As I said, Gateshead had three severe cholera epidemics, 1831 to two, 1849 and 1853. And in 1854, there was a special cholera commission set up which looked at Newcastle, Tynemouth and Gateshead, uh, all areas severely affected by cholera. But Gateshead was the only one of the three to produce an actual map of cholera deaths. And this is a section of that map showing the high street. And on the uh, right hand side, you can see Leonard's Court with a plethora of, um, of dots there. And on the left hand side, you can see Victoria Street, which was next to Melbourne Street that we looked at before. And there are a lot of deaths there as, as well. So there are pockets, all largely focused on various standpipes, but of course, Leonard's Court didn't have one. To try and improve the hygiene in Gateshead, this building was established 
uh, in the mid 1850s. This is the Oakwell Gate baths and wash houses. Now these weren't uh, swimming baths. These were individual stalls with a bath in each. Uh, it cost sixpence for a hot bath and a penny for a cold bath. And there were also laundry facilities so you could take your washing, um, wash it, and then there were um, what were termed ingenious steam drying rooms. Now this shows the Great Fire of 1854, which probably eradicated cholera in the same way that in London in 1665 we have the plague, followed by 1666 the fire. Well in Gateshead we have the cholera of 1853, followed by the fire of 1854. This broke out in a woolen factory uh, close to St Mary's Church. It quickly spread to a warehouse, a six storey warehouse, which housed a huge number of various chemicals, which all imploded at one point. And there was a huge explosion with the result that the fire broke the banks, spread to Newcastle and um, destroyed a section of Newcastle's quayside. It took two days to put the fire out. St Mary's had to be uh, largely rebuilt and 53 people died uh, as a result of the fire. Now, this is somewhere that people didn't want to live. This is the workhouse. It's Gateshead's um, second proper workhouse. Uh, the first was established in uh, Woodbine Street uh, off Coatsworth Road in the 1840s. But it was soon overcramped, and so this new building was built um, at Bensham. And the problem with the workhouse, of course, was that unless you could prove that you could support yourself, you would never get out. And the, the awful thing was that if a family went into the workhouse, if a family couldn't support themselves and had to go into the um, workhouse, let's say you have father, mother and two children, a boy and a girl, each one of those would be segregated um, and kept in separate areas. They might see each other at mealtimes, but they wouldn't be allowed to speak to each other. And this photograph shows the female ward in the workhouse. Um, you can see that the women are not exactly in a uniform, but, but they all have shawls. Many of them have very short cropped uh, hair. This is probably for um, lice. The, the matron at Bensham was um, certainly in the late Victorian period, um, was regarded as very good and very, uh, very caring. Now Gateshead was a, a, a very early railway town. Um, this station, Oakwell Gate, was built um, for 1844 and the first train from London, from Euston, uh, arrived here um, in a journey time of about nine and a half hours. Um, of course, you couldn't go anywhere else. It, the line stopped at Gateshead, that was it. So I think the town had um, pretensions to be a little bit of a tourist area. They built a fine um, hotel for people to stay in. Unfortunately, five years later, the high level bridge was opened and Gateshead's ambitions were effectively scuppered as rail traffic went directly um, to Newcastle. There was no need for anyone to um, alight at Gateshead and then continue their journey by uh, river and uh, road. It only had two platforms. Um, the arrival platform was set back from the departure platform. Uh, eventually, after the high level bridge was open, the hotel was no longer really needed. Um, and the station buildings were converted into engine sheds and engines were repaired here at first, but later on, um, engines were built here for the Northeastern Railway. And this photograph shows some of the men at um, Greensfield, the, the works, um, posing in front of one of the um, engines. Now, I've talked about work. Um, Iron works were very popular. This is John Abbott's, who produced a huge variety of goods from tin tacks to windlasses. Uh, 
their works could be found just below where this Sage Gateshead is today. Um, their rival, well, one of their rivals was Clark Chapman's. Um, now, you can see in this um, engraving, at the right hand side, there's a, a rather nice looking manor house. This, this was originally Park House, which was Gateshead's manor house. Uh, it was incorporated into the works and used as their drawing office. Um, unfortunately, that was um, burnt down in um, 19, 1990. And it was here at Clark Chapman's that Charles Parsons, who was a junior partner in the firm for a while, um, produced the prototype for his um, steam turbine engines, later, of course, used famously in Turbinia. And this is um, Newell's rope works uh, at the teams. Um, they are largely concentrated on producing wire ropes and many of their wire ropes were used for undersea telegraphy. Glassworks were important too. Um, we had uh, three main ones, Joseph Price, which is probably the engraving at the bottom um, on Pipewell Gate. Uh, that was an early glassworks, but it closed really by the 1840s. But then we have George Davidson and, Sow and uh, John Sowerby, who each um, produced a huge range um, of um, a glass for tableware, particularly in all sorts of lovely colours and, and patterns. And we can thank Mrs Beaton for their success because Mrs Beaton in her cookery books advocated having lots of um, various um, accoutrements on the dining table, such as celery jars and salt dishes, all of which these firms um, produced. Now there was an expansion in the number of churches in Victorian times in Gateshead. Um, this was partly due to the rise of Methodism because the Methodists began erecting churches and the Church of England felt compelled to, um, to keep pace. So this is St Cuthbert's, which was um, opened in uh, 1848 uh, and at, at, uh, at Bencham, opened as a chapel of ease to St Mary's, but later became a church in its own right in the 1860s. But opposite it was this building. This was the Wesleyan Memorial Church a magnificent um, building. The Wesleyans were regarded as the, um, the expensive sect of, of Methodism, if you like. Um, they were the ones who maybe most closely mirrored the Church of England. But you can imagine St Cuthbert's on one side of the road and this on the other, pretty good. And I love the gentleman in the photograph just lounging there with his um, with his cane, a little bit of a dandy maybe. This church we don't have anymore, it was demolished in the 1960s. The lower end of Methodism was very much the new connection. And this is the Bethesda Chapel um, where William Booth and his wife um, preached. They lived in um, Woodbine Terrace in Bencham for a few years. And William Booth is credited with um, hugely expanding the congregation at this, um, at this chapel. And of course, Catherine also went on to be a preacher. Um, William didn't actually approve of, of women preachers, but he had to change his mind once, once Catherine found her voice as a preacher. Um, and after that, uh, I don't think he could shut her up. Roman Catholics, rated until 1859, before this church was opened, St Joseph's on West Street, the bottom of Walker Terrace. This was largely paid for by Irish labourers who contributed um, a shilling a week to, um, to pay for it. It was meant to have a spire, but that was never built. Um, I think once the church opened, they realised that they didn't need a spire, they didn't need to keep paying um, more money. So uh, it was left, uh, as you see it there. 
Now, this is the Mechanics Institute, which was built in the 1840s. The idea of this was to improve the education of the working man in Gateshead. The problem was that most working men, when they finished their day's work, just wanted to go home. They didn't necessarily want to go somewhere else to be educated. And the result was that this enterprise really failed. It ended its days as, um, as a bank. But what sort of took over from it was this building, which is the public library, the first public library um, in Swinburne Street. Um, magnificent building. The library actually only had the ground floor and the basement, the first floor, um, was opened up as a school of art. Um, you were allowed to borrow one book, but you had to choose that book from a catalogue. There was no way of browsing it uh, at shelves, but still, it was um, a huge um, boost um, for the working, working classes. And of course, literacy rose considerably during Victorian times. This is Gateshead East Cemetery. Now, Gateshead was poorly served by uh, graveyards. St Mary's had to close in 18, well, it was ordered to close in 1853 because it was literally full to overflowing. Um, there was a small burial ground at St Edmunds off the old Durham Road that was extended um, but still not big enough to cope with um, the numbers um, of, of dead in Gateshead. And of course, St. John's at Sheriff Hill catered for Gateshead fell and, and that area. So in 1865, this was opened. This was the first um, Gateshead cemetery that wasn't affiliated to a church. It has two sections, two sides one for Church of England burials and the other for non-conformists, so basically everyone else. It was designed by a chap called Joseph Lamb and um, it's, it's very nice. It has two raised circular beds, you can see one of them here, and it had two chapels, one for Church of England burials and one for non-conformist burials. Now, if you went to the high street to do your shopping, these are probably the shops that you would have used. These were at the north end of the high street. You can see this is called the Quay, and you might wonder why it's called the Quay. Well, the Busy Burn runs underneath the high street. And originally, where those stairs are, that would have come out as a sort of platform for loading. Um, there's no sign of the, um, of the little rivulet now, but these... Um, shops which look fairly decrepit were very popular. So you have Gaddis, which was a, a boot and shoe shop. And then next to it, you have Preston's brush shop. Now, if you couldn't um, read, you would know this was a brush shop because over the window is a symbol of a boar. And the boar has bristles, which means that, you know, it sells brushes. And then Next to it, you have um, Collier's, a clay tobacco pipe, and Scott and Crow, who were horseshoers and farriers. And then going up the street, um, you have a, a furniture shop uh, as well. Those sort of um, stairs, uh, just to the right of the, just underneath the, where it says farriers, Scott and Crow, um, I believe they were known as Crutchy Tom Stairs but I have absolutely no idea as to who Critchy Tom was. If you wanted to travel in Gateshead, well, Gateshead, unfortunately, is built on hills. It's a bit like Rome. Um, so horse trams were never used because horses just couldn't pull them. But in 1884, we got steam trams. So um, you've got here um, a tram pulled by a steam engine. Now, originally, these trams were open topped but it was soon realized that everybody who descended from the top after a journey was covered with smuts from the engine. So the top deck was soon covered over. These remained in service until 1901 when they were replaced by electric trams. This is a lovely photo 
um, of the north end of Gateshead High Street, with a rather affluent family, they've probably been shopping um, at Snowballs, which was the big department store. You can see there's a steam tram in the background there. Um, the little boy is very interested in the steam tram, but the little girl is more interested in the baby in the pram at the left-hand side of the, um, of the photograph. This is Gateshead's third town hall, but it was the first one that was purpose built. Um, this was built in, uh, opened in 1870, and it has Queen Victoria's statue on the top. And originally, and you can see in this photograph, there are three figures underneath, uh, commerce, justice, and industry. Well, at some point in the 20th century, justice disappeared. So we only have two statues there now. Uh, in front of the town hall is um, the clock, which was gifted by uh, Walter Wilson, uh, who was mayor of Gateshead, but also um, the founder of Walter Wilson Stores. And this is Saltwell Park, which opened in 1876. Um, this was um, created from the estate of William Wales, the stained glass manufacturer. Um, William Wales had um, bought this estate and built this rather um, fabulous but mad house, Saltwell uh, Towers. And he sold the estate and the land to the council in 1875 uh, for a new purpose as a public park on condition that he was allowed to um, remain in the towers with his family at an annual rent of £120 a year. The park was laid out by a well-known Victorian landscape gardener, Edward Kemp, and much of the park today is still what Edward Kemp designed, so it certainly uh, lasted very well. This photograph is taken in the park um, on the occasion of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in June 1897. 32,000 people were in the park on that day. And there was a religious service, bands played. Um, it was a really hot day and everybody is very well covered up. And there are parasols because of course, ladies did not want to get their white skin in any way tanned. The, um, you can see in front of the house in the background, the Almond Pavilion, which was the um, refreshment pavilion, the octagonal sided building. And then just to end, um, here's a photograph of a poor Burns outing in Burns Street uh, in about 1894. All the children are barefooted with the exception of one at the front the little boy with the cap and the rather smart collar. Now we think he's probably the photographer's son who's been told to um, pose in the front of the photograph. Um, that line across isn't a rope, it's a crack in the original um, photograph. But it's a, it's a fascinating image of a lost, uh, of a lost time. So with that, I'm going to um, end this um, talk, but I'll be taking questions um, very shortly. Thank you. Good evening from Gateshead Archive at home, and we hope you enjoyed Anthea's talk this evening. We do miss hosting talks and events at the libraries at the moment. But we're really pleased to welcome Anthea now to answer questions about Victorian Gateshead. Anthea is a local historian, tour guide and adult education tutor here in Gateshead and she's ready to answer your questions about Victorian Gateshead. So while I give people a chance to type their questions into the comments box below, just below this live stream, I do have a couple of questions for you Anthea. Okay. Um, so some of the street names that you were talking about um, sound quite interesting to me, um, like Pipewell Gate and Oakwell Gate. Could you tell us a little bit more about why, where those names came from? Well, Pipewell Gate is um, a, a fairly easy one. It just refers to the uh, wooden pipes that used to carry the water 
uh, from the quayside along Pipewell Gate. And of course, the Pipewell Gate itself, if you walk down to the Swing Bridge with Newcastle on the opposite side, Pipewell Gate is the area along to your um, left. So Pipewell Gate, wooden pipes, water. Oakwell Gate, which is where the Sage is today, um, it's a street that actually doesn't go anywhere. It's quite interesting. Uh, probably is a connotation of Aquel Gate, just meaning water. And Gate just literally means uh, a, a street. It's a Danish. It's a Danish term. So that's what the, there was also Hill Gate, which ran opposite the other side um, from Pipewell Gate. Uh, High Street and Bottle Bank, and they were the five original streets in Gateshead. So it sounds like the street names are sort of referring to features that were present at that time. Yes, yes. And we're still they were in use. From, they were in use for about the some of them the twelfth century onwards. So they're really quite old names. Then I hadn't really. Yeah, they are. They are. Okay. So you talk a little bit about the heavy industry that, that was going on at, during the Victorian times in Gateshead. Can you tell us a little bit more about what it must have been like to live close by to such heavy industry? Well, put it this way, it was so dreadful that the rector of Gateshead decamped from the rectory, which is basically where the sage is today, uh, and moved his whole large family out to Bensham, which obviously then necessitated a longer journey to get to St Mary's. He couldn't just cross the road and go into the um, church. And that was purely because of um, John Abbott's Park Ironworks, which were situated in the area beneath the rectory. And uh, the pollution and the noise must have been pretty terrible. Right along the um, South Shore, you had chemical factories with huge chimneys spewing out noxious fumes, um, the noise from the iron industries, from hammers and uh, later on machinery. Uh, it must have been quite a noisy and a very smelly place in which to live in the 19th century for much of its population. So when you're talking about the rector, he had the luxury to be able to move his family yeah. away. Um, so yes, he did. <laughs> Most people wouldn't have, is, is, am I right in thinking most people would have lived yeah. within walking distance of their workplace? There, there, was, there was no alter, alternative, not until the um, larger landowners began to sell off their estates for streets. But throughout much of the um, 19th century, uh, people were living in uh, a relatively small area of, of housing which obviously developed as the population grew, uh, became really overcrowded, very unhygienic. And that's why you got these diseases such as cholera, typhoid, um, typhus, which was the Irish disease, uh, scarlet fever, smallpox. Uh, it, you know, if you were poor, you were stuck uh, until you got transport and extra streets. Um, you were stuck very near to where you worked. Now we've got a few questions come up in the comments box now. Um, okay. A question from Harry. Um, can you tell me whereabouts Thomas Berwick would have lived in Gateshead, please? Right, Thomas, Thomas Buick lived on the West Street. And Harry, if you know the old post office that's uh, been closed for a long time, um, that was built on the site of Thomas Buick's house. And Thomas Buick, I mean, ironically, when we're talking about disease and horrible conditions, Thomas Buick moved to Gateshead um, because um, it, it was supposed to be quite healthy. Now, I've got to make the point that when he moved here, it was before we had a lot of the heavy industries. Um, but it was said from that house on, on West Street, he could see the church spire across at Wrighton, so he must have had a really good view. That's lovely. Thank you, Anthea. And um, we'll have a question from Rachel. Um, she says, thank you very much for the, for the talk. Very interesting. She learned a lot. 
Where in Bencham was the workhouse and when was it demolished? It sounded horrendous, very tough conditions. Well, if you walk along uh, Coltsworth Road, you'll find the street called Woodbine Street. Woodbine Street was built on the site of the workhouse. The workhouse was demolished. Um, uh, sorry, the, the um, yes, the, the workhouse was demolished um, in 1896, and that workhouse that we saw the photographs of um, is still partly there as Bencham Hospital. So if you um, sort of if you if you know Saltwell Road and you know where the cemetery is. Um, there's a road goes down there to the to the um, hospital, and that was part of the of the later workhouse. So you've got two locations basically. First one off Coatsworth Road, the second one that we saw the photographs of, um, still partly there. That's really interesting. That it's so it's become part of the hospital in. Well, the hospital, the hospital, workhouse buildings developed to have hospitals because obviously if people were ill, they had to be looked after there, they couldn't be taken anywhere else. So workhouses developed with hospital wards. And so far as the workhouse um, at Bencham was concerned, um, it's those buildings that uh, remained as Bencham Hospital. A lot of the workhouse was, was demolished. Right, I see what you mean, yes. Okay, yeah. that's really interesting. So I've got another question from Brian. Can you tell us about Tommy on the bridge, please? And can you confirm if he was a Gateshead resident? Well, that's an interesting one. Um, Tommy on the bridge, I'm not sure that we really know where he lived, but he was regarded as a Gateshead resident. Um, he was an itinerant, he had, it was very sad, he had nothing going for him, poor Tommy. Um, he was orphaned by the age of five, um, he was um, blind, and he just existed by begging, but there's some nice stories about Tommy on the bridge, and the main one that everybody um, sort of talks about is the fact that Tommy would beg on the swing bridge now, of course, half the swing bridge technically is in Gateshead and half technically is in Newcastle. So let's say Tommy's begging on the Gateshead side of the bridge and somebody shouts out, Tommy, the police are coming. So Tommy just steps a few steps back so he's on the Newcastle side and the Gateshead police can't touch him. And exactly the same thing happens if he's on the Newcastle side and the police come from Newcastle together, he moves back to the Gateshead side. Um, so that's the um, that's the story. He used to get very irate because sometimes people used to palm buttons off instead of you know giving them pennies. Uh, and apparently his language was something choice. But um, he was frequently up in the courts for abusive behaviour and begging and all the rest of it. But I secretly think the magistrates liked having Tommy in court because uh, they got a bit of a laugh. Thanks. Thank you for telling us a bit more about that. That's really interesting. Um, so I've got quite a long comment here from Josie. Very interesting. Thank you. I relate a lot of this to my ancestors. Some of them came from rural Northumberland and lived near St Mary's in Carter's Yard and Church Street. Grim places. I saw that at one time there was some kind of workhouse in Carter's Yard, a small yard between High Street and Oakwell Gate, just next to the Dun Cow. I think the early 1800s, although I don't have the date. Do you know anything about it? Well, this can only be Powell's Arms Houses. They were situated behind the um, High Street and they were used illegally as Gateshead's very first workhouse um, until 1843 when we got the one built on what is now Woodbine Terrace off Goldsworth Road. Um, Thomas Powell was a Newcastle merchant in the 17th century who left money for the poor of Gateshead. Why he left money to, the, to Gateshead, I don't know when he was a Newcastle businessman, but never mind. Um, and these were meant to be almshouses for, uh, for the poor. But um, in 1834, throughout the country, poor law unions were, were formed and poor law unions created workhouses. It, it was seen as a a system of what was called indoor relief, so it effectively stopped begging on the streets. Um, the, um, 
the four and twenty who governed the town then just before the town council took over the almshouse and used it as a workhouse that as i say that was illegal um, but in any case it was far too small and in 1843 um, they had to construct a, a, a proper um, workhouse That's really interesting, and I think there are there are some photographs um, just of the sort of entrance way. Yeah, there are um, yeah. houses within the Gateshead archives, and you can search those photographs um, and have a little look at some of the the housing um, and different places that were in between the um, the high street, um, um, sort of behind the high street on the Gateshead Local Studies website, Josie. So you might want to have a little look there. Um, so Gary has asked if we know anything more about the busy burn. Not really. Um, it, it was a little stream that ran underneath the um, that ran underneath the high street, and as I mentioned in the in the talk, that area was called the the key. Um, you used to have platforms going up to the. Uh, up to those shops, which were then taken away, and you got the um, you got the stairs. Uh, just a very small, very unimportant um, stream, just running down into the uh, into the river. And like you said, it's it's not really there anymore. Is that right? No, no. That's lovely. Okay, so we've had quite a few questions there from people. I think that I've picked most of those up now. Um, and I'll just see if any more questions are uh, coming forward. But in the meantime, I wondered if you could tell us any more details about opportunities for learning in Gateshead. You mentioned a school of art above the library building on Swinburne Street. Yes. <laughs> Well, that didn't last very long. Um, that was, I think, you know, Gates had had high ambitions. Um, it had a, it had a very good art master that school, um, but I think once he left, the the school just uh, ended. Um, education, of course, improved in Gates during the nineteenth century, following the eighteen seventy Education Act, when as a result of which. Um, we got a number of, of new school buildings. Um, one of those is still in use, Cows Lane uh, uh, Board School at Low Fell, uh, dating back the original school from the late 1870s and the present school from 1897. Um, so we, we, we did get an education improving with a higher level of, uh, of, of literacy. And uh, of course, we also got the education, the school board education offices, um, which were, are just near the um, central library building today. Thank you. Um, so I think there is another question about the Great Fire. Brian is asking, can you tell us about the Great Fire, how it started and how many people died? And I think we've also got one of our one somebody else commenting on it and giving us a few answers already. Um, I wondered if you wanted to just tell us a little bit more about yeah. the fire. Well, it's a long, it's it's quite a long story. It's a talk in itself, the Great Fire. Um, Fifty three people died as a result, and it took two days to put the fire out. Um, the the main problem was that this this warehouse caught this um, this woolen warehouse caught fire first. Um, we think somebody didn't extinguish the gas light properly. That was the that was the probable cause of it. And near to it was a warehouse, a six-story warehouse containing a huge amount of various um, materials, metals, chemicals. Um, one of those chemicals was sulfur. There was sulfur on every story of this warehouse. Of course, when sulfur burns, you get a lovely purpley flame, and this fire broke out in the very early hours uh, of, the, of the morning. And um, this, the whole case side would have been illuminated. It would have been an amazing spectacle. And of course, people came out to watch, which was a big problem. Um, that partly resulted in, in a high number of, um, of casualties. But people were just watching this warehouse um, and remember, fire equipment was very primitive. You're relying on um, carts and pulled by horses. 
with stirrup pumps. Um, water pressure is a problem, uh, you know, and everything was just totally ineffective. And just after three o'clock in the morning, there was what they called at the time a conflagration when these different substances in this warehouse just seemed to come together and there was this huge explosion, uh, which, as I said, spread across the um, river and destroyed part of uh, Newcastle uh, Quayside, the area where the um, today, where you've got the Premier Inn um, and um, the, the buildings around there were all rebuilt in the 1860s uh, following the fire, that area was all uh, all destroyed, but um, it was it it made the headlines. It made the headlines in uh, in the London papers. And interestingly, I think it turned into the first instance of what we would call today disaster tourism, because the following weekend there were thousands of people travelled by train to Gateshead just to view the devastation to see what had happened. And among those crowds were Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. Wow, okay, okay. that's quite interesting about the disaster tourism, because you mm -hmm. don't think of you don't think of people traveling at that point to go and see no. devastation, but um, it must have been must have been extreme. It must have been, you know, yeah, yeah. well it was. It was it was amazing. I mean, the only other time we made the headlines was in 1080 when we managed to murder the Bishop of Durham, but we'll not go into that here. Okay. <laughs> so I have a question from Lee, um, which was about snowballs. And um, what was snowballs like? Was it sort of the equivalent of shepherds or was it more exclusive? No, it was it was the earlier it was the earlier version of, of shepherds, really. Um, established in the um, late 19th century, and it was nicknamed the Harrods of the North. Um, it was said that you could get anything at snowballs, you could order anything that you liked. And they sold everything from clothes to gas mantles. Um, you could go, you could buy whatever you wanted. And unfortunately, when the Tyne Bridge was built and they built the approach road on the Gateshead side, that totally altered the high street and it totally altered snowballs and snowballs ended up losing um, 30 yards of their frontage, which resulted in them actually changing their address from the High Street to Church Street. And if you um, know Raval Restaurant uh, on Church Street, that actually incorporate that is actually inside part of what was snowballs store. And the store, it, it didn't recover, um, you know, that once its entrance was, was moved, it was never quite the same. And it closed during the Second World War. But fortunately for Shepherds, because Shepherds, of course, had been in Ellison Street and had a terrific fire. And they moved into Snowball's premises for a few years until the new uh, Shepherds store opened in uh, 1951, I think it was. Right, okay, that's great. Um, we do have a question from Rosie. Why did the big landowners around Bencham sell off their estates and where did they move to? Ooh, interesting. Well, some of them moved because um, of the railway. In 1868, we got the Team Valley Extension Line and that cut through directly one of the big estates, which was Red Hoof. Um, and that spoiled that estate, so that ended up getting getting sold. Um, sometimes um, it would be when um, people people died, or they moved to over to Newcastle or other premises. But people gradually began to realise, you see, that um, people wanted building land. House, housing was really necessary in Gateshead from the 1860s onwards. And there was good money, you know, being being paid. So they began to sell off their lands and leave their houses, demolish the houses, and there would be streets and streets of largely terraced townside flats built in areas such as um, the Teams, uh, going towards uh, between Bencham and Dunstan, uh, areas of Bencham um, themselves. Um, 
and throughout throughout Gateshead, gradually things things began to um, improve. And of course, as you got transport improving, you could get people were able to live further and further out um, of the central Gateshead itself. Uh, so you got the the, the suburbs um, coming up in popularity as well. Great, that's lovely. I think we've had some really nice questions. We've had lots of interesting different, different um, aspects people have been interested in there. Um, so I think probably at this point it's time to uh, wrap it up. Um, but it's been a really interesting insight into a very different time. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening, Anthea. Thank you, my pleasure. And we look forward to welcoming you back in March um, when I think you're going to be doing what we're going to be doing. What talk are you going to be doing in March? I'm talking about graveyards in Gateshead. Great. OK, so we're all really looking forward to that. And um, next week we have Richard Pears talking about Anderson Place. So we do hope some of you will be able to make it for that talk next Tuesday evening. Thank you very much all for watching. Um, Alan, you made a comment that you'd joined late, but you'd like to catch up on video. So this, this video will be available on our page for a while, but you might already know that <laughs> if you've um, got this far. And um, so thank you so much for all of your lovely questions and for watching this evening and uh, take care in the, in the wintry weather. <laughs>